Back when I was in college down in Florida, I used to visit this one particular coffee shop on the regular to get my morning gel. It wasn't so much because the coffee was good, which it was, or that it was super cheap, it also was that. It was because one of the employees, a girl named Demi. Demi was a Cubanita, which at first I thought was a cocktail, but turns out it's a name for Cuban girls. She was American born, but her parents came over from Cuba during the whole communism thing and she was without a doubt the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I grew up in small town Maine and where I came from you just didn't see girls like Demi. Most of the girls in my high school were stick thin whereas Demi was, well, not so much. She was, as my kid cousin would call, thick with two C's and I was crushing on her hard from the first moment I saw her. She was also a very unusual barista, and that was because she didn't drink coffee. She didn't even like coffee from what she told me, but somehow she had a crazy talent for making it. I have no idea how that works, but go figure. Stranger things happen, right? Anyway, I was pretty shy when first talking to her, honestly kind of intimidated, but she was so friendly that it wasn't long before I felt confident to lay a few compliments on her. Nothing too forward, just like, hey... I like your hair today, or that bracelet's so pretty, where'd you get it from? Then one time, she hit me back with, you're looking pretty good yourself, with this cute little grin, and then I knew I might have a shot with her. I was so nervous when I asked her out, like I was kind of terrified that she say she had a boyfriend or just wasn't into me that way. I mean, a girl like that always has a boyfriend, am I right? Well, this one didn't. And I couldn't believe it, but it was true. She'd been out of a relationship for around six months, and it turned out my timing was incredibly perfect. We ended up going to this place called Havana's. Not the most creative name for a Cuban cantina, but Jesus, the food was just out of this world. I had this thing called fricas, which is definitely not how it's spelled, but that's how you say it. And throughout the course of the date, I got a crash course on Cuban culture, which is honestly so cool when you get to know it. I know there's a rivalry between the US and Cuba, but there so shouldn't be. We're way more similar than you'd figure. Anyway, that was the start of mine and Demi's little relationship, and for a few sweet weeks, it was basically perfect. One day, I decided to stop at the coffee shop around closing so we could hang before getting drinks at a bar that was notoriously bad at carding. Places closed down now, rest in peace Django's. I'd done this a few times and I always offered to help clean up, but Demi always turned down the offer. She was sweet like that. So I just sat at one of the tables, flicking through one of the college newspapers. It was right near campus, so they stocked the paper. I hear the door open and I look up to see this guy walking in, striding with purpose too looking like he was extremely angry, which is exactly what he was. Feeling kind of protective of Demi, I was kind of like, Hey, yo, buddy, we're closed here. Even though I wasn't an employee or anything, he just looks at me, then looks at Demi and says, This the guy? Like he's totally disgusted by me or something. I couldn't help myself, half offended by the comment and half wanting to look tough in front of Demi, but... I just responded by saying, Yeah, this guy. Who are you? Literally as soon as I said that, the guy reaches into his pocket and pulls out what looked like a Glock. I'm not a gun guy, so it literally could have been any kind of pistol, but I'll just call it a Glock for now because it's easier. Anyways, I'm not kidding, and I just about peed my pants. I know that's not exactly tough of me to admit, but it's the truth. I'd never had a person point a gun at me like that before. Sure, I'd seen guns growing up, but having one actually pointed at you when you know it's loaded. Jesus Christ, man, that's a whole other feeling. Then the next thing I hear literally blows my mind out of my skull. It's Demi, and she says all terrified, Marco, please don't. That's when my stomach dropped and I just knew I was about to either get shot or see Demi getting shot. Demi had mentioned Marco in passing and had chewed him out as being her super jealous ex. All I knew about him was that he was doing eight months in county for beating some guy over something really pointless, and now I guess he was out of jail. 
I know this is cowardly, but when he turned back to Demi and started screaming at her, gun pointed in her face, I actually thought to myself for a moment, I could just run. I could just bolt and he might not be able to hit me with any bullets. But then the reality of letting her down, or letting her die, it hit me like a ton of bricks and I knew I had to stay. I couldn't live with myself otherwise. And after that, I suddenly got all weirdly calm. It sounds nuts, I know, but once you kind of get it into your head that you're going to die or at least get really badly hurt, this weird sense of calm comes over you. I heard the same thing from a pilot friend of mine years later who said he had the engine of a single prop plane cut out on him in the middle of training flight. He was panicking like a rat in a trap at first, but then he said he was like, no point in fighting it. If I'm going to get through this, I gotta be chill. Must be some kind of mechanism in the brain or whatever. Human bodies are incredible, right? So, like I said, I suddenly got this confidence about me. I remember standing up, facing the guy and saying something like, This isn't you, dude. You're not a killer. You don't gotta go back to jail for this. I think that just about made him matter. The fact that I knew he'd been locked up and he turned to Demi like, You were talking about me? Then he tried to grab her over the counter, but she backed off in time and he missed. Right then he points the gun at it again, but I barked at him to get his attention something like, Hey, Marco, right here, buddy. The problem's with me. Unfortunately, he was in hard agreement with that and immediately spins around to aim that Glock at me. He then starts calling me an effing Yuma, like, As if I'm about to let some Yuma mother after take my effing girl from me. I didn't find out till later, but Yuma is what Cubans call all Americans, and I guess Demi was just too sweet to tell me that. Anyway, the next thing I know, Marco sends the grip of the glop smashing into my face, and I remember crashing back into one of the tables, falling over it backwards before landing in a heap on the floor. It didn't hurt right away, but the impact had me almost out for the count, and as I reached up to my forehead and saw blood when I brought my hand back down from it, that same sort of fear hit me again. He's screaming about Yuma this and Yuma that, and I hear this chick-chuck noise like the pistol being armed, and I figure that was for me. But then, get this, right when he's about to shoot me, right as I'm expecting to just suddenly not exist anymore, I see Demi holding something, almost leaning over the counter. I don't know what she said to the guy because it was in Spanish and mine was god-awful back then, but whatever it was, it was enough to draw his attention just long enough for her to throw something hot and liquid right in his face. The scream he let out was like nothing I'd ever heard before. It was like something had erupted from deep down inside of him, something that sounded barely even human. I figured she'd just thrown some hot coffee in his face. I was right about to scream in her favor when I actually got a look at Marco's face. Something was stuck to it, like a kind of crystally brown gunk and it was actually steaming as he tried and failed to get it off. She screamed that we had to leave as she hopped the counter and ran towards the door. I followed, head bleeding and out into the street. We ran down the sidewalk to a bodega, ran inside and called the cops. Then as she's on the phone with 911, in between talking, I asked what she threw in Marco's face. She gave me this real guilty look before she kept talking, so I didn't find out what it was until later when she was explaining what Yuma meant. It was hot coffee alright, but there was a whole bunch of sugar in there too. And for those that don't know, that's the same kind of stuff they do in prison to the really bad prisoners. It sticks to your skin and cooks it right to the muscle, and it leaves absolutely horrific scarring. I normally wouldn't have wished on my worst enemy, but we were in a kind of life or death situation, so I suppose there was just nothing else to do. Okay, I just realized how long this thing has gotten, so I'll wrap it up as best I can. Now given the circumstances, Marco was taken to the hospital and kept under police watch. Then once he was finally ready to be discharged, he was arrested for what he did. According to Demi, he didn't end up going back to jail, but instead went to a nut house somewhere in another state. I guess whatever face he had left just messed up his mind, and that figures if you ask me. Me and Demi did stay together for a while after, but 
broke up when she ended up getting accepted into a college up in the northeast. It sucked. I really loved her, but people just move on, I guess, and LDRs aren't something we were capable of. I have this pretty cool looking scar these days, right up near my hairline, and I think I have a pretty cool slash scary story to go with it. I hope you find time to read this in one of your videos sometimes, although I'm not too sure where it would fit. Maybe psycho ex-boyfriends, maybe. Anyways, love your content and keep up the good work. I used to visit this one Starbucks here in the UK, and I still do from time to time, but I had a really bad experience there once that put me off going for almost a whole year. So, it was this really hot summer in 2018. I don't know if many other English people listen, but they might remember how hot it was. I'm not usually one to go for a frap, but oh my god, it was just so roasting outside that I needed something to cool myself off. So instead of my usual venti latte, I went for a frappuccino to keep chill. Not just that, but the staff had really ramped up their air conditioning to keep themselves nice and cool too, so walking in and feeling that artificial breeze hit me, and basically thinking ice cream coffee, I was in heaven. Anyway, just as I was enjoying my frap, I get a tap on the shoulder. It was an older man, but that's not hard considering I was 19, and he gently places another frap on my table. Then, in a way that was actually quite sweet, he says, A girl as pretty as you deserves a treat on a day like this. Keep yourself nice and cool, sweetheart. This one's on me. I actually thought it was quite a nice gesture at first. A little sus, but still very nice of him. So I did what any polite young woman would do. I just thanked him, but had no real intention of drinking it, and only because I was so full from the first one. But then as soon as the guy walked out of the Starbucks, I looked up to see one of the baristas at my table. I can't remember what exactly it was he said, not word for word anyway, but this is basically the gist of it. He told me that he felt he had to warn me, because the man who'd given me the drink had literally gone into the toilet with it like minutes before he handed it to me. At first, they hadn't thought anything of him ordering the same drink, hot day and all that, and he made no indication that he was intending to give it to anyone else. But then, thank God the barista was alert enough to notice what he'd done immediately after receiving it. Because as he said, he literally could have put anything in there, and we'd all be completely unaware. What if I'd actually had the room to drink it? Maybe been a little bit more naive or something? There could have been drugs in that frap, and... That's about the nicest thing I can possibly think of that could have slipped in there while in the bloody toilet, for God's sakes. I know this probably isn't the scariest story as you get sent, but it's an incident that stuck with me for literally years now. Random guys can be just so bloody creepy. My name is Cassie and I want to tell you about one of the nicest, most generous, and honorable people I ever knew in my entire life. His name is Miguel Algenid, and he was my manager at the coffee shop I worked at up until the spring of last year. Miguel's father was Lebanese, while his mom was from Colombia, and although they were different religions and backgrounds, they fell in love because of their mutual love of coffee. Together, they opened up a small but successful cafe over in Brooklyn, and once they retired, they passed it on to Miguel. I started working for Miggy, our cute little nickname we had for him, back during the summer of 2019, and he was by far the best boss I'd ever worked with. He mostly employed college students like myself on a part-time basis and understood that we needed flexibility as well as finance in order to live semi-comfortably while completing our studies. As a result, we worked our butts off for him. We wanted him to succeed. We wanted his business to succeed. Not just for him or us, but in honor of his parents, who had one of the most magically romantic stories I'd ever heard. But then, the virus which shall not be named hit, and like so many other businesses in New York City, the cafe's profits began to dip before disappearing altogether. We tried to make things work, adapting to becoming a mostly delivery-based service, 
but a combination of fear and hardship made things almost impossible. One by one, Miggy had to let us go, until in the end there was only myself and two other employees working in rotation to keep the cafe running. And when I say rotation, I mean heavy rotation. By the summer of 2020, I was down to two three-hour shifts a week, and all I'd do was go in, clean, prep for deliveries, and then go home. Miggy and one delivery driver would then run the business for a full 15-hour day. Then, out of business hours, Miggy would perform a full antiviral clean-down in order to pass inspection from city officials. If he failed them, the cafe would be shut down indefinitely. For a while there, Miggy was working 19-hour days and was barely sleeping at night due to the stress of potentially losing his business. I know this is quite the introduction, and I guess you're probably asking out loud by now, yeah, this is grim, but how is it scary? Well, the scary part of this story isn't so much the loss of the cafe, which I'm almost certain is being turned into a Starbucks or a Shake Shack or something by now. It's that I watched a man lose his mind in real time. Miggy was almost at a breaking point by the end of the summer, but time after time he refused help from us as he simply didn't have the money to pay the wages. At one point we even offered to work an extra hour for free just to help him keep going, but as you can imagine, he said he'd rather close up entirely than accept slave labor, his words, not ours. He lost weight, he became emotionally and mentally distant, it was soul crushing to behold. We all wanted to fight the virus, so I'm not saying all this is some kind of anti-lockdown, anti-masker type stuff, but the costs the measures were incurring were truly painful to bear witness to. Things started to look up around the beginning of fall as the mayor or the governor or whoever it was began the whole reopening phase. We were actually allowed to reopen to an extent, and although capacity was cut to like 25%, we all got more hours and Miggy actually started to make a profit again. I remember him just not showing up to work one day and we all got pretty worried and began calling his cell phone. When someone finally picked up, it was his cousin. Miggy had passed out for almost 18 hours, the first time he'd slept more than 8 hours in almost 7 months. We just ran the cafe as best we could, hoping we'd do Miggy proud then figured he'd show back up at work when he was able to. When he did, he wouldn't stop apologizing for his no-show. In our minds, he'd done absolutely nothing wrong, and we were just happy that he'd had a chance to get some real rest. Besides, with the loosening of restrictions, things were looking up for the cafe, and we all figured that we were over the worst of it. But then, on the morning of October 6th, we got some very, very bad news. I remember it was like yesterday, even what day of the week it was, a Tuesday. Due to a spike in recent cases, the governor introduced what was called a micro-cluster strategy in order to contain the problem. The cafe happened to fall into one of the red zones, which were subject to the harshest kind of restrictions. Previously, because we were delivering food and coffee, we were deemed an essential business and were allowed to stay open, even if we weren't allowed to have any customers inside. But under the new micro-cluster thing, the little baklavas and obleas weren't enough to be considered substantial foodstuffs. Therefore, we were forced to close again. Miggy was holding back tears when he called me about an hour after the news was announced. As much as I tried, I just couldn't find the words to reassure him. Honestly, I knew we were in trouble, and I was terrified for him. That cafe was his entire life, and once again it looked as if though it was going to be taken away from him. As you can guess, due to a lot of people working from home, the demand was absolutely enormous. So, once again, Miggy went back to working 19-hour days, mostly all alone, in order to keep deliveries running. A co-worker of ours, Ronnie, attempted a kind of intervention and went in during his days off to try and talk Miggy into getting some rest. And Miggy fired him on the spot. To fire someone like that just wasn't in Miggy's character. We knew he was grieving, but to think it was having that much of an effect on his personality was just devastating for us. Ronnie wasn't even mad, he was just sorry, and figured he'd go talk to him once he was feeling more like himself. 
Now we know that day might not ever come. After the holidays, I knew I might have to walk on eggshells around Miggy, that he was cracking up from being stressed and overworked. But the reality was so much worse. Miggy had never been particularly religious, so I remember the shock I felt when I saw that he'd mounted a large wooden cross in the cafe's office. That might not be anything to worry about with anyone else, but when I walked in and saw the way he was just staring at it, it was a bizarrely disturbing sight. When I asked if he was okay, he gave me this really faint, uh-huh. Like, although he was right there in front of me, his reply came from somewhere very, very far away. Then he asked if I wanted to pray with him. You know, I said yes, and despite me being a pretty staunch atheist, I bowed my head and held Miggy's hand while he said a little prayer. I honestly thought it would be some generic, Lord, let us be grateful for all we have kind of thing, and I'd never have remembered the exact words if he didn't mention which book of the Bible he was quoting it from. It was from Hosea, and I just had to look it up to find exactly which one, but it's Hosea 13.16. Miggy said, Samaria shall become desolate, and for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed into pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. Amen. I didn't even know the Bible contained things like that, and I literally didn't know what to say, so I just added a weak amen before I walked out of the cafe to carry on with my work. The rest of my shift passed without event, and it wasn't until I got a text from a coworker the next day that I actually got scared for Miggy's mental health. The text came through in the early afternoon, accompanied by a picture message. Miggy's been drawing these for hours, it said. I thought he was doing work on the books, but no, he's been drawing these. At first I had no idea what I was looking at, but I remember feeling this deep chill run through me when I saw just how many there were. Miggy had drawn maybe 50 or 60 of these huge, lidless eyes, and surrounding each larger were rings of much smaller eyes. They were rough sketches, not too much detail to them, but it was clear that they were literally hundreds of little eye rings covering several sheets of paper. I asked Elena, the girl who had sent the pictures, if she could ask Miggy what they were, but she said that he was acting really weird and was too scared to confront him about it. She then followed up by asking me if I could see if he was okay, so next time I was working I did just that. I know this sounds crazy, but his explanation actually eased my mind a little. It was obvious that Miggy had found a new passion for religion due to the stress of his ordeal, and I figured it helped him cope, then who was I to interfere? So, when he explained that what he was drawing were angels, let's just say I was confused but open to understand. When I asked why he'd envisioned angels to be so, well, disturbing, he produced a small leather-bound Bible and began quoting from the book of Ezekiel. I've managed the exact verse he was quoting from and I've chopped it down so you get an idea of what he had in mind. As I looked, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. They sparkled like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. Their rims were high and awesome and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Wherever the spirit would go, the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Just like the weirdly bloodthirsty Samaria quote from Hosea, I had no idea that that kind of thing was in the Bible. We're raised to think that all angels are winged babies or beautiful Caucasian folks in long coats, but the reality is much, much different. Go ahead, look up cherubim. They're basically animal-human hybrids. If heaven is real, it could be way more terrifying than blissful in my mind. Once I explained all that to Elena, she was still pretty anxious about Miggy's mental health, but she definitely wasn't straight up scared as she'd been before. Again, it was a case of whatever helped him cope, and I know for a fact that he was terrified of his parents at the time, as both were elderly and living in an upstate nursing home. 
If you know the story of New York's nursing homes during 2020, well, you'll understand why Miggy was so scared for them. We didn't think that we'd have to make any further intervention. We loved Miggy. All we wanted for him was to be okay. And if that meant backing off while he tumbled down the religious rabbit hole, so be it. Now, I know we should have taken action long before we ever started to slip. Elena started to get scared when Miggy asked her to pray with him. She texted me after her shift was over, the message full of spelling and grammatical errors where she'd obviously just hammered it out in a horrified frenzy. She told me that he'd talked about the dead coming back to life, which is pretty standard for the Bible, I imagine, but it was the language he'd used that had really freaked her out. She said he talked about a valley that was covered in bleached human bones, like every inch covered in skeletal remains. I looked up the verse in question and wasn't surprised to find it was from Ezekiel. Obviously, Miggy had been focusing on that part of the Bible and it read like this. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, those bones are the people of Israel. I can imagine how terrifying that must have been for Elena to hear. I don't think she'd been to church since she was in junior high, and even then her parents were Greek Orthodox, so all the sermons were in Greek. Heck, she might have heard the exact same passage in Greek and never once batted an eye. But right up close in plain English, talking about an army of the living dead during the pandemic, I completely sympathized with her when she said she was thinking of quitting. I just promised her that I'd try to have a talk with Miggy the next time I was on shift, and that hopefully he'd understand why everyone was getting so scared. Little did I know, it was about to be my turn to be so scared I'd want to quit. I remember the morning I showed up to find something staining the door to the cafe. I figured it might be vandals or something, someone who might have objected to us trying to stay open when we were in the middle of a red zone. I had no idea what it was that was smeared on the glass of the door, but as you can imagine, I was in no mood to try sniffing at it or touching it. I'd just go tell Miggy and we could get it cleaned off. But as soon as I walked into the cafe, this hot, coppery smell hit me hard. I knew what it was right away. The cold had stopped me from smelling it on the door, but inside, with the heat and steam of the coffee machines warming up the air, I knew what it was. Trust me, a guy might not be able to recognize it right away, but a girl with her monthly visits from the old shark week, we know the smell of blood when it hits our nostrils. Sorry if that sounded a little gross, but it's true when it's true. Anyway, after I realized what I was smelling, I basically went into full panic mode. I thought Miggy might have hurt himself, that he'd finally exhausted the last of his stamina and just decided to check out early. Besides, if he was so convinced of resurrection of the flesh, so convinced that he was a son of Israel, it'd be the rest that he needed before being reassembled by the breath of the Lord. I ran through the cafe, ducked under the counter hatch, then ran toward the back office, all the while shouting Miggy's name. When I reached the door I found it was locked and right then I was just convinced that he was gone. The best boss I'd ever had, the most caring, gentle, passionate person I ever knew, was now nothing more than just another casualty of the pandemic. I remember hammering on the door, finding my own sense of religion as I prayed that Miggy still had the strength or the will to help me save him, and when I heard the lock click open, it felt like God had answered my prayers. But, in actual fact, it was more like the devil had answered them. There stood Miggy, covered in blood, and I mean from head to toe, and he was smiling. I remember pulling my phone out to dial 911, but again, he smiled and just said something like, It's okay. It's not my blood. I think he expected me to put the phone down, but the piece of info just made me even more terrified. Had he heard a delivery guy? Maybe Elena or a prospective hire? 
I just remember taking a few steps back, feeling myself trembling while I gripped my phone, knowing I better not hang up on 911 given the circumstances. After that, he just sort of laughed at my reaction, backed up out of the door frame, then showed me that this empty coffee bean bucket that had been half filled with blood. Cassie, it's lamb's blood, he said. You got nothing to be afraid of. Only then did I actually hang up the phone after telling the waiting operator that it was nothing but a false alarm. Well, only kind of a false alarm, because although it was definitely an emergency, it was nothing the cops or EMTs could fix. There was one person I knew I could call, but not until I was in the free and clear. But in that moment, I needed to know what in God's name he was thinking. I guess it sounds kind of dumb that I didn't make the lamb's blood to religion connection right there and then, but you try in thinking straight when you're surprised by your blood-soaked boss after thinking he tried to finish himself. I asked him again, straight up. What in God's name are you doing, Miggy? And after playfully telling me not to take the Lord's name in vain, that same disturbingly warm smile, he quoted the final Bible verse I'd ever heard pass his lips. Again, I had to look this up to get it word for word, and this is what he said. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. I just ran out of the cafe, down the block, and pulled up a number I'd saved in my contacts about a month prior. Remember I told you about Miggy's cousin picking up the phone when we tried to call him that time and he was passed out? Well, he was just as worried about him as we were, so in light of that we ended up swapping contact info just in case anything bad happened and the cousin needed to step in. I thank God we did that, honestly, because I really wouldn't have known what to do after running out. I wouldn't say I'm particularly woke or anything, but I know well how injecting police into a mental health situation could have made that thing so, so much worse. After that, his family stepped in, and the next time I spoke to his cousin, it was to tell us that they'd temporarily closed the cafe while Miggy was checked into a psychiatric hospital. But temporarily quickly became sort of permanent, and the last time I walked past the cafe before I moved back to Philly, there was a for sale sign outside. Like I said earlier, now it could be a Shake Shack or, God forbid, a Starbucks or something. And as much as the whole thing is a freaking shame, an insane shame to be honest, I'm just happy and hopeful that Miguel is finally getting the help that he so richly deserves. Bill Dwayne Wheeler Sr. was a portly man of medium height and thinning hair who spent the majority of his early 20s traveling around the western U.S. It was during this period that he fell in love with the world-famous City of Sin, Las Vegas. By 2010, Bill had been married five separate times to four different women, and he might be mistaken for thinking him something of a ladies' man, but ask Bill's sister, Pat, and you get a very different answer. Bill had no brains, she once said. He was looking for true love, so women could just about talk him into anything. Couple that with the fact that Bill was practically surrounded by beautiful young women and he started to understand why his life was something of an emotional and financial time bomb. Bill ran two businesses in the state of Washington. One was a legitimate private investigator's business, the other was a considerably seedier grab-and-go coffee stand where barely clothed female baristas would serve small coffees at big prices. Some of the grab-and-go regulars called it the Sexpresso Place, a place where the baristas blurred the line between tongue-in-cheek flirtatiousness and straight-up peep shows. But legal troubles stemming from the stands weren't the only controversies in Bill's life, as his eventual disappearance and assumed death would prove to be one of the most mysterious and sinister scandals in Nevada's history. Bill might have owned businesses up in Washington, but his home was Vegas, and around 10 a.m. on May 26, 2010, Bill landed at Las Vegas' McCarran International Airport after a brief trip to the Evergreen State. Bill's brother-in-law, Mark Tetzlaff, 
gave him a ride to his home in Spring Valley, just west of the Vegas Strip. Bill spent the journey on the phone with his wife, Carol, and although he spent a great deal of time up north, he and his wife appeared to share a deep and emotional bond. The couple had adopted Bill's biological grandson, and Carol cared for the boy just as much as her own two sons from a previous marriage. Yet it's evident that despite the couple's rekindled romance, Bill and Carol were married, divorced, then remarried. Cracks were forming in their marriage, and Bill hadn't planned to stay in Vegas for very long. After picking him up from the airport, Mark joined Bill in the garage of the Spring Valley house to fix up his prized white Mercedes. They had no luck, so instead, Bill planned on driving back to Washington in a tan 2003 Toyota Tundra. According to Carol, after returning home, she and Bill had an amiable discussion on family and finance before Bill departed for a second home, a vacant four-bedroom rental just a few miles away on West Tropicana Avenue. It was there that Bill loaded a $15,000 deluxe espresso machine onto the Tundra's truck bed, one he intended to install at a new grab-and-go outlet back near Seattle. Later that evening, Bill began the 1,000-mile, 16-hour drive back to Washington, but told a friend that he'd be back in Vegas before the week's end. But in reality, it was the last time anyone would see him alive. Three days later, a man on a motorcycle was passing through Victoriaville, California when they were greeted by the sight of a burned-out truck. It was the exact same Toyota that Bill had been driving. The Inferno had blown out the truck's windows and turned the tan paint job to a scorched ash. Investigators determined that the fire had been deliberately started in the truck's bed, where the huge espresso machine now lay as a smoldering husk. But there was no sign of Bill Wheeler. Half of Bill's family believed he was dead, while the other half believed it was an attempt at faking his own death. Those that believed that he was still alive cited the fact that he was deeply in debt and was on the verge of forfeiting his real estate for failing to keep up with the mortgage payments. This is on top of the sizable alimony payments he owed his series of ex-wives, and that he was facing charges up in Washington for allowing his baristas to actually sell themselves, so to speak. Faking his own death would allow him to skirt all impending legal proceedings. But what tangible evidence is there to support the fake death theory? Well, if Mark Tetzlaff is to be believed, Bill is living a life of luxury on the island of Puerto Rico. He was sending a ton of his money there, stashing it away. He later told investigating FBI agents who took his claim seriously enough to launch an investigation in conjunction with the IRS. Besides his family, law enforcement officials from three separate states are actively hoping to locate him, with some declaring that Bill is most certainly still alive. Bill's family has also stated that despite the espresso stand's supposed success, they were actually more of a burden than a boon. Some of his employees suffered from drug problems and were said to routinely steal from the registers in order to feed their habits. They believe their father wanted an out, but was simply too proud to say so. In his mind, there was no other solution than to manufacture his own demise. They also point to the fact that cadaver dogs have yet to find a single trace of Bill's body anywhere near the I-15. Yet despite the compelling evidence of his continued existence, there are many who believe that Bill was the victim of a murderous conspiracy. He just wouldn't disappear without saying goodbye to his family. He just wouldn't, insisted Bill's sister, who agreed that his disappearance was the result of foul play. My brother's dead. We just haven't found his body yet. This is certainly supported by Bill's actions in the run-up to his disappearance, as he was acting like a man preparing to close a chapter in his life. Bill was not only planning on opening up a used car lot up in Snohomish County, Washington, he also had an important testicular cancer surgery lined up for the week following his disappearance. It also makes no sense that a man in such a dire financial position would happily set fire to $30,000 worth of assets in the middle of the desert. It's also clear that despite the veneer of success and stability, Bill had many enemies. When an article detailing Bill's disappearance appeared on SeattleWeekly.com, vitriolic debate erupted in the comments section. Friends, family members, ex-employees, and business associates waged a war of words, some claiming he was a monster, 
with others claiming he was a good but imperfect man. Even his brother-in-law, Mark Tetzlaff, who he was apparently fairly close to, once called him a pervert who regularly practiced infidelity. Bill was also said to overindulge on the drug OxyContin as a way of lessening the pain of his chemotherapy, and many noted that he seemed to be taking way more of the drug than his prescriptions allowed. This could mean he did business with drug dealers in both Washington and Nevada, and we all know what dealers do to folks who run up bills they can't pay. Not only that, but Bill's treatment of his employees might also have caused a great deal of offense. He was said to be selling OxyContin to some of his drug-addicted baristas, and on more than one occasion, he faced accusations of violent misconduct in the workplace. One of the women convicted of public indecency was just 18 years old, with her close family having no idea she was involved in such a thing. Suddenly learning this would certainly make a father or brother extremely angry, possibly even angry enough to inflict physical harm. As far as law enforcement are concerned, foul play simply cannot be ruled out. Police also noted the inconsistencies and in statements made by his wife Carol in the period following his disappearance. An official from the U.S. Department of Justice said that none of their stories of his disappearance coincide with telephone reports or neighbor's testimony. Dana Fitzpatrick, who worked at one of his coffee shacks, had stated multiple times that she believes Bill was murdered. He told me he had to go to Vegas for a short business trip and that he'd be returning four days later to go to Chelan with Michelle. Michelle was apparently Bill's girlfriend and the woman he was planning on leaving his wife for. Dana also said that Bill showed her and other employees a picture of Carol before telling them, this woman is not to be allowed anywhere near his business. Pat Thurbrush, the sister who argues Bill is deceased, has also made multiple claims that Carol had something to do with his death. She called Carol ruthless and claimed she long harbored feelings of deep resentment towards her brother. He said he called as soon as he left Carol's, she said, so he had to be already dead not to call. I don't think he ever left there alive. Yet if that were true, that would mean Mark Tetzlaff was lying about Bill departing Vegas in the tan Toyota, but what would Mark have to gain from such a lie? Well, everything. Following his disappearance, not only did Carol inherit all of Bill's businesses, she made Mark himself the general manager of all of his Vegas-based outlets. It seems no coincidence that Bill disappeared just as he put plans in motion to divorce Carol, and it was Mark who was quick to produce a 2009 insurance policy that confirmed Bill and Carol as legally married. Bill's children from his second marriage also claimed foul play, with Bill Jr. stating that, I have no doubt that Carol did something to my father. She is motivated by greed and money. This is no mere hearsay either, but something Bill was happy to swear in front of a court of law if given the opportunity. However, even with the chance to do so, he suddenly declined, and this might have something to do with the fact that Carol is the sole legal guardian of Bill Jr.'s eight-year-old son. This was done while Bill Jr. was enlisted in the Air Force and was mainly the result of a vengeful move from Bill Jr.'s ex-wife, who was also said to have forged his signature on the court documents. Carol, who has since renamed the coffee stands Carol's Espresso, made a counterstatement which read, Bill Jr. has always had a hatred for me since his father adopted my two sons making him no longer the oldest. Also, my eight-year-old is afraid of him for threatening to put him in the trunk of his car as a punishment. Bill Jr. has flat out called this a lie and claims that Carol has poisoned his son against him. He also claims that he had a good relationship with his father and was shocked to hear that Bill had written in his will that I specifically desire that my son, Bill Dwayne Wheeler Jr., receive nothing whatsoever from my estate. It makes sense that the expansion of Bill's family circle might lead to his other children receiving less of a share, but to cut him out of the will completely seems very unusual. My dad had no reason to run, and he left me in charge of the coffee stands before he vanished, Junior later said. Sure, he was behind on bills, but he always was behind on bills, and he always paid up. His patterns were very consistent, and I know this because we were in constant communication. Then all of a sudden... He just vanishes. Mark Tetzlaff felt such an overwhelming urge to dispel the violent rumors that he held an interview outside of one of Carol's coffee stands, 
stating that neither he nor Carol had anything to do with Bill Sr.'s death. Carol isn't going to give them any money, he said, referring to Bill's kids and sister. That's why they say she hired someone to kill him, but that's categorically false. Mark once again asserted that Bill was alive and had been funneling money into offshore accounts, even producing paperwork which supposedly confirmed it. Mark was also able to confirm that after inheriting Bill's businesses, he discovered that he owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes. I just paid off 50000 Mark said during the interview, and that didn't even put a dent in the total amount. I bet my last dollar that Bill was trying to escape the IRS. They've been all over the grab-and-go offices for years now. The FBI even got involved at one point. If it was me, that's exactly what I'd do. Fake my death, burn up a few assets to make it look real. He might have fooled his kids, but he hasn't fooled us. As disturbing and mysterious as this case is, when seeing it from Bill Jr.'s perspective, it takes on a deep melancholy. Bill Jr. seems to have spent the majority of his adult life emulating his missing father, citing his law enforcement experience in the military. Jr. opened a background check firm, Century Investigation Services, just like the one his father ran. He also opened his own espresso stand in the Everett Mall area of Washington, which he named Grab and Go, just like his father's. It's also clear that out of all of Bill Wheeler's relatives, his oldest biological son had been the most active in tracking him down. He was discovered that after 10.32 on the day of his disappearance, his father's phone was completely inactive, and this is contrary to Mark Tesloff's claims that Bill made calls to Carol and his businesses after he arrived at his Spring Valley home. Junior had also discovered that on May 29th, three days after his father's disappearance, his cell phone showed signs of malfunctioning. This is long after investigators claimed that his truck was set alight, meaning someone was in possession of the phone, destroying it when they determined it to be a liability. This had divided investigators, with some claiming this is evidence that Bill retained his cell phone, despite one being found in the Toyota's burned-out wreckage, while others claimed it as proof that the phone remained on Bill's body until he was either cremated or disposed of in some other fashion, days after his supposed disappearance. Perhaps the most compelling piece of evidence that Bill Jr. has presented are his photographs from a visit to the final place his father was thought to have been, the vacant rental house in Vegas where the espresso machine was stored. In the presence of Vegas police officers, Junior took pictures of red stains on a carpet, as well as gaping holes that appeared to have been smashed in the walls. Several bottles of bleach were on a countertop, most were completely empty. Even the accompanying police officers believed it looked like a crime scene, and when Junior told them he believed it was the site of his father's murder, they agreed it made for a very convincing argument. When confronted by police, Mark Tetzlaff claimed the stain was from an earlier ink spill and that tenants had left the house in a filthy condition, hence all the bleach bottles. But that would make for a rather convenient coincidence, I'm sure you'll agree. As for escaping the Puerto Rico and the much-discussed offshore accounts, Bill Jr. claimed that he poured through his father's records long before Carol and Mark ever arrived in Washington. There were no signs of any money funneling, secret amounts, or death-faking intrigue whatsoever. In fact, Junior claims that the most powerful evidence of his father's murder is that Carol and Mark had already faked a bunch of paperwork before he even disappeared, thus proving premeditation and conspiracy to murder. At the end of the day, the only thing we know for sure is that investigators from a variety of different agencies have been completely unable to decipher what amounts to a dense and enduring riddle. Just about every theory imaginable has been floated before them in order to explain Bill's disappearance. But the bottom line is that no one knows what happened to him, nor are we ever likely to find out. Las Vegas has one of the most sophisticated missing persons task force in the Western world, as more than 2,000 people go missing there every year, but even they have been unable to find him. Perhaps the general feeling is best summed up by a quote from Bill's sister, Pat, who once said, I just want to find my brother's body. That way, we can all be at peace. We can all just put this behind us.
I used to work for quite a large chain coffee shop about 10 years ago. A coworker of mine I worked with told me that one morning before I was hired, he came in real early, about 4 a.m., to get started on a deep clean that was going to take all morning to complete. While he was doing an inventory of the cleaning supplies, another employee came out of the bathroom, drying his hands with a towel, and was extremely surprised that my coworker was there. He asked him what he was doing there, and the guy made up some excuse about how he was out late and needed to use the bathroom. Believe it or not, a year or so later, the guy was convicted of murdering one of his escorts and was there cleaning up after one of his kills. Can't really get any creepier than that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon. Or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.